seems to have happened um, is that we went from sedentary foragers hunting and gathering these wild plants and animals, increase in population size, and then we had, in conjunction with that, a period of drought and a decrease, not only as a result of overexploitation, but a decrease as a result of the climatic change now, um, to the abandonment of most of these sites. And these people probably went off following those, um, those resources that they had been utilizing. Um, and, and then resettled in, in sites that we have not yet uh, found and cult began cultivating. They had all the tools, they knew how to do it, um, and, and began the cultivation to artificially increase the food resources that they had. Uh, and this is what ultimately resulted in the domestication of the plants. Um, now there's, um, there are a couple of different steps that they needed to go through in order to do this. One can't just walk into a field and, and cut, the, cut the plants down and plant those wild plants and expect to get domesticated plants. That won't work. Um, you need, you need a, a mutation here, which occurs naturally in the wild stand, but you need to, to select for that mutation. You need to select those plants that already have this domesticated characteristic. And in order to do that, you need to cut the plants in a certain way so that you don't shake, um, so that you don't, uh, so that you're selecting for this, this, this uh, domesticated type. The domesticated type, remember, is the type that doesn't fall apart when it ripens. It doesn't propagate its seeds. The seed head remains as a whole head. And um, one way to, to select for this is to take one of those sickles made from those little blade tools and grab a bunch of the plants by the heads and cut them. And this will select for those heads that remain intact when you, when you do that process. Um, if you go through the, through the plants and beat them to collect the seed, um, you will merely collect all of those that naturally shatter the wild type. And if you plant those, you plant wild type, you get another field of wild type, and you can go on doing that forever, and you'll never get a domesticated field. If you take these sickles and cut them in this way, and then select for those domesticated, those mutant plants is what you're collecting here. You're collecting a bunch of mutants. Um, or at least a proportion of your crop that you're collecting there is, is mutated. You then subsequently plant those in an area where the wild plants aren't growing because you don't want all of those wild seeds growing in, the, in your field. Um, you clear a new area where those wild plants aren't growing, and then you sow that field with your specially selected plants that you cut specially with your sickle. Um, you are selecting for these domesticated types, and you will, um, it, is, it is estimated within the space of about 20 years, produce a fully domesticated field a field of fully domesticated cereals. So this whole process of domestication, going from a wild stand to a fully domesticated field, probably took place in as little as a, as a human generation. Um, this is something we're never going to see archaeologically. Uh, that level, that fine tuning uh, of, of chronology, we will never be able to identify archaeologically, which is one reason why we don't see these sites where we move from wild plants to domesticated plants. Not only were, were most of the big sites we found so far unexcavated, and precious few of these sites have been excavated, I should emphasize that, um, but we, don't, we won't see this kind of, of change taking place, okay? It's go when the change takes place, it's going to be very rapid, very abrupt, if we ever do find a site where this happens. And it might not even be recognized um, as, as this kind of change. Um, in such short, such short a time. So that's one of the one of the problems in, a, in in addressing this question. But that appears to be how the process must have taken place. There are certain steps that these people had to have learned or or, or reached, and we know that they had the tool types. Uh, we know that they had the wild cereals, and um, it appears that they had the other kinds of conditions including the need to increase their food resources because the population was getting too large uh, and the food resources were decreasing 
um, because of climatic fluctuation that forced them into this, into this process to artificially increase their, their crops. Uh, all of this took place sometime around 10,000 years ago. And by 10,000 to 9,700 years ago, these sites like Jericho, like Abu Reira, and others that have been excavated um, are reoccupied now with a fully domesticated um, assemblage of domesticated species, um, and, and they carry on Neolithic, uh, Neolithic life and expand once again um, and, until they reach maximum uh, carrying capacity of the, of the land. And then again, sometime around 8,500 years ago, we see another collapse in the Levant. Um, possibly, again, a conjunction with a climatic fluctuation, but it appears at this point the introduction of the sheep and goat into this area resulted in, in, in massive devastation of um, some of the natural vegetation, which resulted in erosion, um, and then that combined with increasing cultivation, um, deforestation to, um, for the purposes of, of building, because they had all these houses to build, all of these destructive processes, the kinds of things that we're talking about now in the tropical forests that, we're, that we continue to do, people were doing 10,000 years ago in the Near East, and we see the effects of this. And population expansion, um, and sites increase, site size increases, complexity of site increases until about 8,500 years ago, and then wham, everything collapses, and there are whole areas of the, of the Near East that are totally abandoned for, for um, uh, several hundred years again. Um, now that particular event, 8,500 years or so ago, is what probably was one of the, um, the kicks that resulted in, ex in, in expansion of population outside of the Near East. Um, this is a, one of the problems that, uh, that I have been looking at. Um, in, with respect to the um, introduction of agriculture into Europe. Oh, this, there we go, okay. Um, we see, first of all, expansion of, um, of settlement into um, Cyprus here. This is, a, is a, a diagram of the hypothetical expansion of agriculture out of the Near East center. Um, it may be correct. I have my doubts about this one, but it, that might also be possible. We don't have enough data from Western Turkey to say that this is, this is real. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is most likely the sites that we have, early Neolithic sites in, in northern, uh, at North Africa, in particular Egypt, date to about uh, 8,000 years ago as, um, as populations again were expanding in this area. And um, it's a, clearly a Near Eastern assemblage of sheep, goat, wheat, barley, lentils, etc., that come out of these areas. Okay, and none of those plants or animals were native to Egypt, so they had to have been introduced at this time. We see, first of all, though, um, sites expanding in um, in Cre uh, Cyprus, excuse me, uh, right here. Okay, and one of the important sites that we've has been excavated in, in Cyprus is this one um, going up this hill here. This is the site of Kirokatia in southern Cyprus, uh, excavated in the 50s by um, the Cypriot archaeologist uh, named Dikios. He excavated mostly this lower part of the village here, which in fact is a, is a, is a more recent part of the Neolithic village. Um, there's a large wall going up here. And in more recent years, a French team has been excavating up at the top of the hill and uncovering much earlier material, although we don't as yet have any carbon-14 dates from this material. It appears to be probably as early as, as um, uh, 8,500 to possibly 9,000 years ago. Uh, and I think when we do get radiocarbon dates, which we will, uh, within the next year or so, we'll find that, that it, it, it does date for about that time. 8,500 uh, to 8,000 years ago being the time here when we had this, this second collapse of, of settlement uh, in the Neolithic uh, Near East, okay, and, and people moving off easily accessible 
um, in Cyprus. You can see Cyprus from Lebanon. And settling in, in um, this village of Kirokatia, uh, which kept expanding through time, as we now know from these earlier ex excavations. The earliest occupation so far uncovered, uh, the houses looked pretty much like this, made of mud brick. Here you've got a, a, a number of courses of the mud brick wall preserved. Um, the stones on top here are from uh, a subsequent building that was built after this one was abandoned. Here's the doorway into this building. And you would have, in, on this side, a number of these, of these buildings. Um, <coughs> thank you, pardon. A number of these buildings grouped together. Here's another little one over here. Um, there's another one over here. And um, all the doors facing out into what appears to be a little open area or a little courtyard between the buildings. This is similar to, to the situation you see in Africa in crawls, where a family builds sev several structures, perhaps for several wives, um, with the open courtyard where all the wives get together and fight or make food or whatever wives do when they only have one husband. Um, and uh, within these areas between the houses, you have little installations like this. Um, this is one of these large grinding slabs, uh, a quern, uh, on which was ground the wheat and barley that these people were consuming. There were two of them, this big one here that's still in place, and another one that was sitting here that they had removed by the time this photograph was taken. Um, and several other large flat stones that might have been used to set the baskets of cereal on that they would remove the grain from and, and then grind it. Uh, and we found massive quantities of grain, all the Near Eastern assemblage, wheat, barley, oat, um, lentils, and sheep and goat on this site, all introduced uh, to the site. And this is some of the earliest occupation on the island. There, there is only one site that has any earlier pre-Neolithic occupation, and it appears to be a, a, a single purpose hunting site where the inhabitants were were visiting and uh, killing off a few pygmy hippos and elephants and then going away again. Um, this is what the site then looks like uh, in, during one of these early periods. All of these little round structures here, this is actually a diagram of a later period, um, with stone-built structures, uh, with interior um, walls or benches around them in some cases, interior hearths. Uh, some of them have interior pillars in them to hold up, uh, there's one here for example, a pillar to hold up perhaps a loft where they would store things. Um, these aren't very large houses. These early ones measure uh, two to three meters in diameter. Some of them as small as one meter in diameter. Um, perhaps not all used as living quarters but some storage facilities, etc. Okay, so that's the typical um, early Neolithic kind of settlement that you get in in Cyprus, and if we move then to Greece, further east, the earliest evidence we have of occupation in Europe, um, of Neolithic occupation in Europe, domesticated plants and animals, in other words, um, comes at about 8,000 years ago. Um, none of the sites so far excavated, and I have to say there have been precious few of these, only a, a handful, only about five, uh, or so sites that have any kind of systematic excavation on them, um, date all of them, the earliest levels date to around 8,000 years ago. So that this movement out of the Levant or perhaps out of Turkey at the same time and probably for the same reasons um, resulted in, in populations um, settling in uh, northern Greece. The area we're looking at here is up in Thessaly. Um, the large Thessalian plain right up here, uh, where you, as you wander across the plain, which is difficult to do because now it's all cultivated, you, you run across these little bumps in the landscape. These are mounds or magulas as they are called. This is a teensy one, probably a classical one. Some of them are, are, are very large and have occupation going from the early Neolithic from 8,000 years ago up through the classical period. Um, and they just dot the landscape. Many of them now have been destroyed as a result of increasing or intensification of, of agriculture um, and the natural for forces of erosion, etc. 
Um, but, the, but there are, so far, have been found through survey, um, nearly 500 of these, of these sites. Um, a substantial number of them, um, well over uh, 150 of them being, uh, having early Neolithic occupation on them. Um, we also have um, early Neolithic occupation in southern Greece and a few sites, and one of the more important ones, in, in my opinion, uh, is Franky Cave here. This is a site I did my dissertation on. Um, and it's important primarily because it, um, it has a long period of occupation. It's like Abu Reira in Syria. It has pre-Neolithic and Neolithic occupation with a break between the two, okay? Not continuous occupation. This is the cave here. It's a large cave. It's about the size of a football field uh, from front to back and about 50 meters wide. And it's just above the modern shoreline, which is just off the slide down here, about 50 meters away. Oh, this is just another site in Thessaly, one of these large, low magulas there. We know. Thing. This was inside the cave. Um, to give you an idea of, of size here, there's a person sitting down inside the trench there at a table. Um, this large trench here we'll look at next. It goes down 11 meters um, until we hit water, uh, groundwater. This trench goes down 13 meters um, and we hit rock at the bottom. And not natural bedrock, but roof fall. Um, the picture was taken from another roof fall. Um, the huge boulders that the photographer was standing on here came from the roof that resulted in a complete collapse of part of the roof. So there's a window in the cave uh, nowadays that sep and the, the collapse separates the front one third of the cave from the back two thirds of the cave. Um, so we could only excavate this front part. There's more roof fall out here. It's a very unstable area. It wasn't. Um, it was a little nerve-wracking digging in here once the geologist told us that it was a, it was a very unstable cave. Uh, it was pretty evident from all of the roof fall around it. Now, uh, in addition to the, the Neolithic Near Eastern assemblage of um, domesticated wheats and lentils and other legumes and sheep and goat, which appear at 8,000 years ago at this site, um, we also have this kind of material which shows up earlier uh, this is obsidian, a volcanic glass from one of the Aegean Islands, the island of Milos, which is about 150 kilometers away. And um, it, as I say, occurs earlier in the cave at about 10,000 years ago. And the Mesolithic occupants of the cave or, or someone with whom they had contact was going out to Milos in a boat, um, probably island hopping out there and back, bringing back the obsidian. In the Neolithic period, by 8,000 years ago, this becomes um, about 70% of the material that is used to make stone tools. So it's gone from maybe 10% in the Mesolithic period to 70%, a substantial leap, which means there's, there's either a lot of trade interaction or, or there are people um, from Franklin who are in the business of going back and forth or whatever but it becomes an important commodity at this time in the early Neolithic. And it shows that there was a lot of movement within the Aegean Sea, which is important if we're going to talk about people coming from the Near East, bringing, um, bringing their Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals and their lifestyle of settled village life. Um, they're going to be coming through the islands and, uh, and exploiting these kinds of resources on the way. This slide here just looks down that very large uh, 11 meter deep trench in, this, uh, in the previous slide. Um, Neolithic occupation here, getting down to Mesolithic occupation layers, and then down way at the bottom, Paleolithic occupation layers. The deepest layers go down to sometime around 30 to 35,000 years ago. And the occupation ended in the cave sometime around 3,000 years ago. So it's a long, not unbroken sequence. There are periods of hiatus, periods of abandonment of the cave, certainly. Um, one of the things that shows up, interestingly enough, in the earliest deposits in all of these sites is pottery. Uh, and there's still a question as to whether or not there's an, there's an aceramic period, as we saw in Cyprus, as we have in the Near East, a long period of domestication, 
of um, Neolithic culture, but no pottery. They were using stone and baskets, etc., cetera, um, for containers. The earliest Neolithic we have in Greece almost always shows up with pottery, and there are a few sites where too little has been excavated to be certain. Um, this is the early Neolithic kind of pottery that shows up. These two large baggy bowls and little, little ones like this. The rest of this is, is later Neolithic, and we don't need to go into that. But it's a relatively simple pottery, but it's clearly well-developed pottery. These are not experimental pots. It wasn't developed here at Franckley. It was introduced, and it was introduced at the same time that the plants and animals were, which suggests that it had to have been brought in with them. Although it is made with local clays, um, the technique was brought in. These people weren't experimenting with how to make pots. Um, so we have the introduction into Europe at about 8,000 years ago of a fully Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals and the full Near Eastern culture. Um, and I will just leave you with one problem. We won't go into, I think it's getting a little, uh, a little late at this stage in the game. Um, we won't go into the whole problem of the development of our boar culture, olive domestication, grape domestication. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions on that, but um, uh, let me just finish with this one problem. If, if we have um, uh, no aceramic Neolithic in Greece, we have a fully developed Neolithic culture with a Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals. Um, our next problem to solve then is where exactly did these people come from? We can't connect artifacts like, like the pottery or, or other kinds of artifacts from the sites directly to any one place in the Near East. We can't yet connect um, the plants specifically to any one place, the Levant or, or Turkey um, or, or anywhere else in the Near East. The plant assemblage is a Near Eastern assemblage and it shows up in the Near East at the same time all over the place. Um, except for one species of plant, and this is the one that we need to look for, uh, and that's the wild, or the, the domesticated rye that I mentioned earlier on. It only occurs in northern Syria and Anatolia. It is native in wild form to those areas. It does not occur to the south. Um, and if, if populations were coming from Anatolia, for example, from western Anatolia across the Aegean or up through Macedonia, um, bringing their Near Eastern assemblage with them, we would expect to find domesticated rye in this assemblage. And so that's, that's my next problem, is to excavate a site sufficiently and this has never been done in northern Greece yet, uh, to, and systematically to collect the plant remains from the site to see if we can find some of these um, identifying plants, uh, the, wild, the domesticated rye in particular, um, but there may be others that we as yet don't know about. So there are still more problems to be solved. Um, which will keep me employed for a while longer, which is a good thing. Um, there are many more problems to solve than I can solve, and there are not enough people uh, who do this kind of work in this area. Um, so if, if any of you happen to be interested in this kind of study, whether you're a botanist or uh, an agriculturalist or uh, um, an archaeologist, uh, this, this is one area where there's a, a great deal of, of room for, for development and more questions to be answered by all of the different disciplines that are involved in these kinds of studies. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Yes? The process you describe that seems to take place in the Middle East where um, nomadic foragers become sedentary foragers and then settle down into agriculture. Does that take place in other parts of the world where agriculture <coughs> develops, such as China and the Americas? Apparently, it does. We're seeing China <coughs> and the Southeast Asia in general, <coughs> excuse me, is still in an early stages of being explored in this respect, but <coughs> um, we're beginning to see the same kinds of processes um, where we have 
those, those areas that have been well enough surveyed so that we can get a picture of settlement patterns in pre-Neolithic times, pre-domestication times, um, we're, getting, we're getting something of the same kind of pattern with, with larger um, apparently settled sites or at least larger base camps that are occupied for longer periods of time um, prior to the domestication so that, so that sedentism does seem to be something of a prerequisite here for, for domestication. Um, we also see the same thing, for example, in South America in the sites that have been studied in Peru uh, and um, to some extent in Mesoamerica as well, although I'm not as familiar with that material, I have to say, as, as I am with other, other areas. Yeah. Well, fishing is an interesting problem in general. Um, there was a theory um, at one point, and it, it is still a perfectly valid uh, theory with some support, that at this period of the close of the Pleistocene, um, as we have an expansion of these resources, um, we have uh, a, a diversification in resource exploitation, so that not only were they exploiting the larger animals that they had been hunting and some of the wild plant resources, but they did tend to move toward the coast. We tend to find more coastal sites during this period, during the Mesolithic. This is certainly true in Europe. Um, it, it, it may be true in the Near East. The problem is that, um, well, it's the problem all over Europe, uh, all around the Mediterranean at least, is that the coastal sites are now underwater for the most part. With sea level rise, um, we've lost much of the Mesolithic population. This may have happened, what it may have be what happened to the population in northern Greece. There's no Mesolithic population in northern Greece to be able to say whether they were coastal or not. I mean, they might have been coastal and now they're underwater. Um, <laughs> But that seems unlikely because not everybody was living on the coast. Certainly, the coast is more exploited, and with Franklin material, certainly the coast is more exploited at this time. Um, so, in some areas, yes, that does seem to be the case. With the Near East, I wouldn't say that 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 there's any direct connection between exploitation of fish and domestication of, of plants or animals. Um, I think fish just became another resource as sea levels rose. Um, those people who had been inland now found themselves on the beach. Uh, this was over a long period of time, but, but sea, le sea levels brought with them coastal changes that made the coasts more attractive for a variety of resources, not just the fish that would show up, but the shellfish as well. So there probably was a movement toward the sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, did you push another group out? Ooh, the $64,000 question. Um, I think not. I think that other group was not there. The geologist who studied the sediments in the cave has said that there's a period of at least 500 years hiatus from, from the latest Mesolithic occupation we have to the er appearance of the earliest Neolithic. There's a, there's a discontinuity in the sediments at that point, which appears to to mean that there was a period of no sedimentation, no deposition, which means that there was no occupation. Does that mean that these groups that were cultivating plants were going into, into places that weren't occupied? I think so. Okay. Yeah. What happened to the Mesolithic people, again, it, one has to address this question. Um, the, the Mesolithic population of Franklin, if, if if you look at the survey data from, from around this region, there are a couple of other Mesolithic sites in the area. Um, and there's a f another one further north, but um, there's, no, there's no dense occupation. Um, and there, the Mesolithic populations in northern Greece, well, there isn't any in Thessaly. There's none in Macedonia. There's some in, in western Greece um, that, that hang on and remain 
Mesolithic while the rest of Greece is becoming Neolithic. So they, they're hangers on it. And this happens in, in Europe as well, where you get Neolithic populations coming in in one part and exploiting lowland arable areas while Mesolithic populations are living up in the mountains and continuing their Mesolithic way of life for a very short period of time, it only probably lasts several hundred years until the Mesolithic population adopts um, agriculture, excuse me. Um, but at Franchthi, um, which is the only site that's been excavated so far in Greece that has a Mesolithic occupation followed by a Neolithic occupation. There's no other site so far that we found in Greece with this kind of deposition. Um, we have this hiatus, so it, it would appear that at least the site was abandoned and these people went off. I don't know where they went. They went into the water. They drowned like lemmings. Um, they don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. These grains that were collected and, and ultimately cultivated, um, does the physical evidence allow us to figure out how they were prepared and served? No, it doesn't really. Um, we can make guesses based on, on the kinds of tools they have. These big grinding slabs would, would suggest that they were grinding the grain. Um, we have no remains of anything like bread, for example. Um, in the, the earliest sites in the Near East, we have no pottery, and we have, therefore have no residues in pots or anything like that. Um, my guess is, and I have to say it's only a guess, um, is that they were probably grinding some of the grain into flour and making flatbread as they have done for thousands of years and are still doing today. Pita uh, bread. Uh, and um, some of it they may well have been just cracking and boiling, making bulgur and, and other kinds of, of... These pots you're showing look like things you could serve beer in. Uh, could they have been fermenting these grains? They could have. Sure, they could have. Um, again, we don't have any evidence for that directly, but that's certainly possible. That would have been a powerful incentive to settle down and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, settled on the, the original couch potatoes with their cans of beer and no television set. Um, yes, they could have. They could have been making beer in these. These are not terribly large pots here. Um, really, the the largest the largest Neolithic one is this. This one here um, is only about this big. So it's, it's not, we're not talking about the kinds of things that you find, for example, in Mesoamerica, these big beer boiling um, pots. But um, there's nothing to say that they couldn't have made beer. Um, we don't have any direct evidence for beer um, until we have written evidence from Egypt. And that doesn't come in until about 3000 BC. So we don't. Where does leaven come along to make the bread rise? Uh, well, in order to make the bread rise, you need um, a, a different kind of wheat than we have early on. You need bread wheat. That begins to show up around 6000 BC, fairly early on, really, in the periods of domestication. Uh, and but it doesn't catch on until the Bronze Age, really, not until after 3000 BC. So we don't know when real leavened bread is made. Um, there's no mention of leavened bread in the earliest writings in the Near East, as far as I know. Um, so even though they had this bread, um, they may have been, it, it may have risen just because of yeast in the area, uh, in the air, I mean. Um, so it might have risen naturally. Um, but there's no deliberate leavening of bread, as far as I know, uh, early on. It comes in, um, I think, by the classical period, and after that. Madeline. I was really struck by your statement that it takes as little as one human generation to domesticate a set of wild plants. Do you anticipate it's ever going to be possible to see that it happened in one spot and spread outward or simultaneously. Um, I'm thinking of theories, for example, um, sort of along those lines related to the development of the European languages. Did it start in one place and spread out? Or was there spontaneous generation? Um, well, yeah, that's a hard question to answer, really. I, mean, I don't have an answer to that. I'll make one up. Um, the data, the studies that are being done now, and there are a number of studies being done um, 
both in England and in southern France with experimental farms. First of all, to make sure how long does this take, okay? They've, they've taken the wild plants and they've been cultivating them and harvesting them in the way, with, with the prehistoric tools that they find on these early sites um, and in the ways that they think would have been done. And they're actually using a number of different methods to see which one results in the domestication. So we don't know for sure that it only takes 20 years, but all of the data points to this. Um, and there was, at one point, a computer program that a botanist in, in Wales developed to, to test this theory on the computer. Um, and it supported it. Okay, so we got 20 years here. Are we ever going to be able to see this on an archaeological site? Well, no. Um, what we're going to see, if we ever find a site where we don't have this hiatus between, between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, um, if we have a site that is continually occupied from which we have plant remains that are in good condition and abundant enough, what we're going to see is all wild cereals, for example, um, and then um, all domesticated cereals. And there's going to be a, an abrupt, a very abrupt change, um, which some would suggest, well, that's what we're seeing now. For example, at Franchi, um, we've got the wild cereals, except we don't have wild wheat at, at Franchi. We do have wild barley at Franchi. And then, wham, we've got domesticated barley. But there we have geological evidence that says we have, we have, a, we have a hiatus there a break in occupation. Um, but that's the kind of thing we have to see. I don't think we're going to see it at any one site and then, and then spreading out afterwards. Um, I think that domestication took place, this whole process of cultivation, harvesting, replanting, took place at a number of different sites throughout the Near East. Um, it took place using only one specific subspecies of these different plants that have been identified. But these plants occurred in enough places that it, it had to have happened um, in, in a number of places simultaneously. These people were not ignorant of each other's, of doing uh, what everyone else was doing. So there was enough communication that, uh, that it happened very rapidly. And then it spreads to the east and to the west um, fairly rapidly, actually probably within, a, within the space of, of 100 years or so, we're, we're having major populations in, in, certainly in Cyprus and then in, in Greece and the islands. Well, not the islands, in Crete and in mainland Greece. The islands are not occupied until much later. Yes? Are there any human remains in any of these sites that can be used to determine the dietary health of Yes, now there's an interesting question as well. Not enough, I could tell you that. Um, some of this stu study has been done because one of the questions that, that paleonutritionists along with archaeologists have been asking is what, what effect did domestication have on the population, uh, on, their, um, on their health for one thing, um, and can we see the change from, from pre-domestication to domestication in human bone remains. Um, and uh, one person who did a study on some Mesolithic um, individuals in the Near East, um, Margaret Schoeninger, who's at the University of Wisconsin now, um, studied human remains from a number of Mesolithic sites and several Neolithic sites in the Near East. And her conclusions were that she could see no change in diet, basically, in the quantity of plant foods these people ate during the Mesolithic period compared to the plant foods they ate in the Neolithic period. Um, and this isn't surprising. Now that we're getting more botanical material out of the Mesolithic sites, we're seeing the full range of types of plants, cereals, legumes and a wide variety of fruits and nuts being exploited in the Mesolithic uh, and the same kinds of things being exploited in the Neolithic, although not quite as wide a range. In fact, the quantity of plant foods that they ate or the, the diversity of plant foods they ate in the Neolithic is much less than it was in the previous period. So their diet actually um, 
changes for the worse in some cases because they don't have the diversity. Uh, and along with domestication, the other thing the physical anthropologists are discovering is that um, there, these people were, um, they worked much harder in the Neolithic period. The, the stress on bones um, is much more prevalent in the Neolithic, uh, especially on women, compared to the Mesolithic uh, skeletal remains. We don't have vast quantities of Mesolithic skeletons, I have to say, or Neolithic ones for that matter, but we have enough now that studies have shown that there is a significant um, uh, change in, in stress. Uh, amongst these populations. The same thing has been found amongst Native American populations when corn agriculture is introduced into North America. Um, the, the whole quality of, of their, um, their life, their health, decreases with the advent of agriculture. So um, these are different kinds of changes that are being, still being studied. We need more skeletal material from the Near East to, to really examine this. Yeah. If agriculture started because uh, the climate was getting worse and people were hungrier, um, there must have been other times where human populations experienced worsening the environment and scarcity, and then didn't start it. I know. Uh, this is another another one of those problems that uh, you just wonder. Well, why not? Why didn't they? They had. Um, some people have said, well, the the specific domesticatable plants and animals weren't available in those earlier periods. Certainly throughout the Pleistocene there were periods when uh, there were interglacials when conditions got better and the resources were available and then they got worse and resources were no longer available. Um, the, the major difference, as, at least as far as we can tell from looking at settlement patterns and um, estimating population size is that during these earlier periods the population was small enough and the and the social organization of these populations was such in small groups small bands that um, when conditions got worse they simply moved to another area and where they could continue to exploit the resources that they were used to exploiting. Um, we didn't have, we don't have any evidence for settlement, for settled populations, and that does seem to be a, a uh, significant requirement for uh, A, population expansion, uh, and B, um, ultimately domestication. The earlier populations when these conditions occurred didn't, hadn't been settled. They hadn't they were mobile and they just remained mobile and they got more mobile and, and just moved away and moved into, into better conditions. The other question nobody's asked, which is the obvious one, is why did they do it in the first place? I mean, why, um, well, I've sort of answered that question, uh, but, the, but the, the classic question that everyone asks is you've got these ideal conditions in the Mesolithic with all of these abundant uh, resources. Um, and we see this in, in Europe as well, um, the Mesolithic populations with abundant resources that didn't, where we don't see severe degradation as a result of drought. We don't see severe problems with overpopulation in the Mesolithic period like we do in the Near East. And yet these people who had other kinds of resources didn't take up agriculture either. Um, and yet they were settled uh, populations. And I think, uh, one of the reasons there is um, is because uh, they were able to diversify their their exploitation of the environment sufficiently, which goes back to the question about fishing, um, exploitation of the coastal um, uh, areas more, um, uh, greater areas of, of woodland that they could move into and exploit in some cases um, that they they simply didn't they didn't need to. Um, expand their, their resources artificially. Some of these questions are questions that we just, we don't have the answers to these things. We need more research. We need more data. Yeah. I have, I have one question. Did I understand you when you said that food animals were domesticated after the plants seemed to have been? Oh, 
no, not quite. Um, the, the animals were probably domesticated about the same time as plants were, but the plants were apparently domesticated in the Levant, whereas the animals were apparently domesticated in the Zagros Mountains, as nearly as we can tell at the moment from, we haven't been able to do much excavation in Iraq and Iran in recent years, so it's hard to tell. Um, and the sites that we do have were excavated fairly early on when the data collection methods were not ideal. Um, so we might never be able to answer those questions exactly, but, but the data we have now appears to, to say that sometime by 10,000, 9,500 years ago, plants that were domesticated in, the near, in Levant and animals were domesticated in, in, in the Zagros, and we can in a couple of cases show sort of a progression of animals around the Zagros Taurus arc. And by certainly 8,500 or so uh, years ago, they were in the Levant, because we, we have evidence for them in the Levant. They don't show up as domesticates as early in the Levant as they do, as, as domesticated plants do. 